Thank you very much, Amisha, and thank you very much for all of our panelists. Uh, for those of you that have been following along in the app, you can see that we are a couple of minutes behind time now. Um, also, one of the things that you will notice is, if you're following the app is that we have some parallel sessions. We have the sessions that are happening here in Plenary 3, and then we have the Knowledge Theatre sessions. We are recording each of those sessions, so whichever one you choose, if you want to catch up another one, you can do that on demand at any stage during or after the conference. Um, I believe now that we... We have to, before I actually introduce the next panellist, but there is a, a, a quick video that we would like to play. So if we can play the video, please. Or not. There you go, that was on behalf of the uh, DECA uh, and the Victorian sponsors. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, our next, or our first keynote speaker for this morning, uh, Mr. Malcolm Turnbull. He was Australia's 29th Prime Minister and he served from 2015 to 2018. Uh, he's also the chair of the Green Hydrogen Organisation. Uh, he's had international careers in law, business and the media. As Prime Minister of Australia, he reformed personal income tax, education and childcare systems. He oversaw the uh, legalisation of same-sex marriage and announced the construction of the Snowy Hydro 2, the biggest pumped hydro, hydro scheme in the Southern Hemisphere. Mr Turnbull embarked on the largest peacetime investment in Australian defence capabilities and set out Australia's first national cyber security strategy. I've had the pleasure of meeting Mr Turnbull several times uh, at various locations around the globe, always in conjunction with renewable energy. So Mr Turnbull, welcome to the stage. Please make Mr Turnbull welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Victoria, for hosting this uh, this conference. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with my colleague Jonas Moberg, the CEO of the Green Hydrogen Organisation, and we're looking forward to uh, uh, continuing to meet with so many other uh, people like you who are committed to the clean energy transition. Uh, my key messages today are about opportunity, but above all, urgency. Australia has the potential, the wherewithal, the building blocks to be a green hydrogen superpower built on the back of our world-class but not unique solar, wind and hydro resources. Now this is an economic opportunity and a, an emissions reduction imperative. We need green hydrogen, we in Australia, to meet our own commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 43% below 2005 levels by 2030. With green hydrogen, we can decarbonise the chemicals and fertiliser sector, as well as heavy industries like steel making and heavy transport, which cannot be easily electrified. Green hydrogen also has a role to play as an important storage medium for renewable energy, together with batteries and pumped hydro for grid firming. A very important point, which I think many people miss in the Australian context, is that when thermal generation goes out, we will have no continuous generation in Australia at all. Our primary generation will be overwhelmingly wind and solar, firmed, as I said, by pumped hydro, batteries, green hydrogen. So firming is absolutely critical, you know, unless you sort of in the small modular reactor sort of fantasy experience. Uh, now, green hydrogen and green ammonia will have many uses domestically, 
not least in replacing the 40, 425,000 tonnes of grey hydrogen currently used in ammonia production for our agriculture and explosive sectors. But then there's exports, and that's really the big deal. Green hydrogen will allow us to continue to be an energy exporter. Instead of shipping dirty coal and LNG overseas, we can ship green hydrogen in the form of ammonia, which is in high demand in Japan and South Korea, as you know, or better still, value-added products like green iron for steelmaking around the world. And being part of the green steel revolution is certainly something we can capitalise on since so much of the journey for steel starts under our own soil. We already see a willingness for buyers of green steel to pay a premium. H2 Green Steel in Sweden has already locked in BMW and Mercedes as buyers. It makes sense. Green steel, which uses hydrogen to reduce iron ore, ultimately to steel, but of course initially to take ferrous oxide to produce green iron, using that hydrogen instead of coking coal is more expensive at the moment, several hundred euros more per car but much less than the marketing benefit, which is why the car makers are so keen on it. And the cost is only going to come down. Now, those ships trading green hydrogen can also eventually run on hydrogen derivatives like ammonia or methanol, which will further reduce emissions and increase demand for our own green hydrogen. So the opportunity is clear, but we cannot repeat this often enough. We need to act with urgency. We have every single resource we need in abundance, except for one, and that's time. And time is running out. We're in a green hydrogen race to redesign industrial society in record time. If we are in a battle to save our planet as we are, we have to mobilize our national resources as we would for war, not for a languid tea party. Half measures will not do. By the end of last year, only one Australian project with a capacity of 10 megawatts or more had reached a final investment decision. This compares to almost 1,400 megawatts of capacity in the EU and 300 megawatts of capacity in the United States, not to mention China, where they are forging ahead at an unprecedented pace on all fronts of the renewable transition. Now, we need to pivot fast and with conviction. We have to give renewable energy and genuinely low carbon solutions a real chance against well-established and entrenched fossil fuels and carbon intensive solutions. We have long supported in Australia the fossil fuel economy and built modern society around carbon emitting activities. Now we've got to do the same for the low carbon economy. And if done well, it's going to create enormous opportunities for us. Now, many countries are realising this. The United States, with its Inflation Reduction Act, is the most notable, providing a production tax credit of up to US dollars, $3 per kilogram for the greenest hydrogen. Other economies, including the EU, are putting in their own support mechanisms and demand quotas. Now, even in those economies, there's more to do. I hear about many projects which are making good progress, but which fail to generate the numbers necessary for them to go ahead. Our governments have further to go in charging for carbon emissions. The Australian government's $2 billion A dollar hydrogen head start program is a good start. And I'm very glad to see that blue hydrogen made with fossil fuels is not eligible. We must not put public money into a technology that is expensive and neither captures enough CO2 nor sufficiently minimises leakage of highly polluting methane. I am old enough to have been a cabinet minister in the Howard government, environment minister in fact, at a time when we all thought carbon capture and storage would work. We have been trying it and investing billions in it for years, and it rarely, if ever, works. I mean, blue hydrogen, so-called, is a delaying mechanism of the fossil fuel industry to essentially delay the transition to the green hydrogen economy we need. We've got to, rec we've got to be clear-eyed about this. 
Uh, we need to see many more than two or three flagship green hydrogen projects being supported, and we need much more support for hydrogen hubs around this country. We need to keep the momentum up so that those flag flagship projects can begin production by 26, 27, and take the final investment decisions this year. And then we need, Australia needs, a comprehensive response to the Inflation Reduction Act as soon as possible for our renewable sector generally and green hydrogen sector specifically. Further financial support is required, as the government has committed to, but we don't know the details yet. Bloomberg New Energy Finance, from whom we'll hear more later when Kobad Bhavanagri, its uh, global head of strategy, provides a forecast update, recently published its new product, the Hydrogen Subsidies Tracker, showing that subsidies for hydrogen projects has reached US dollar 280 billion worldwide, apparently up 43% since the beginning of the year. That tracker strikes me as an excellent tool, as does everything Bloomberg New Energy Finance produces. But we should compare the 280 billion that Bloomberg New Energy Finance has found in subsidies available to hydrogen with the actual subsidies to fossil fuels. The International Energy Agency, often considered close to oil and gas interests, concluded in February, I'm quoting, in 2022, subsidies worldwide for fossil fuel consumption skyrocketed to more than one trillion US dollars, by far the largest annual value ever seen. So, you know, I, I would encourage our friend, our mutual friend, Kobad, to consider introducing a cross-reference to the level of subsidy to the fossil fuel sector, which is the sector we need to be getting out of, uh, not into. In other words, we're spending, governments are spending more subsidising the fuels we've got to stop burning than they are on encouraging the fuels we need to start using. On the launch of the support tracker, Bloomberg's head of hydrogen, Martin Tengler, also wrote, the US and the EU offer the most money. Asia has seen remarkably little support, despite a lot of talk from countries such as Japan and South Korea. While what he refers to as talk from Japan and South Korea is now turning into actions, for example, through the recently announced Japanese hydrogen strategy, targeting $100 billion of investment, we must, as a matter of absolute priority for the health of the planet and for jobs at home, make sure that we in this region do not fall behind in providing the enabling measures. Bloomberg makes a last headline conclusion I think is worth noting, which is that most subsidies target hydrogen production, while few specifically target hydrogen demand. And I know Kobad's going to talk more about this this morning. For the market to grow in line with what would be needed to reach net zero emissions, we'd need to see more demand side incentives. Now, this is particularly true for the Inflation Reduction Act for the, in the US, which is largely about providing production tax credits. Here at home in Australia and in our region, we have an outstanding opportunity to support the demand for green fuels, such as green hydrogen and its uh, you know, subsidiary products like ammonia, green ammonia. Uh, I'm here particularly thinking of how our government can catalyse the use of green hydrogen to make steel, how our government can catalyse the use of green ammonia to make fertiliser and fuel our ships. Governments and measures to enable the transition is not just about financial incentives. It's also about being more efficient. Nowhere is this more important than planning and permitting so we can deploy the renewable and green hydrogen infrastructure to get on with this part of the energy transition. There are major disparities between different Australian states on the time it takes to grant planning permission. Now, Ross Rolfe, uh, the head of Iberdrola in Australia, formerly chief executive of Infogen, is here somewhere. Ross, are you here somewhere? There he is. Uh, Ross was, the, was twice the coordinator general in Queensland. Queensland's the time, Queensland and New South Wales, for example, where I live, have essentially the same, you know, climate objectives, energy objectives. There's no, you know, no material differences. But it takes so much less time to get projects approved 
and underway into FID in Queensland than it does in New South Wales. So, you know, we, I think we as an industry need to be highlighting and tracking the differences uh, in, um, uh, you know, permitting times and processes so that jurisdictions start to compete on being efficient. We need to do this globally too. You know, I was on a, a we have a, a sort of global planning, a planning for climate commission, uh, which I'm, of which I'm a member, and the CEO of Iberdrola actually is, is, is also on that. And we were talking about this issue in a global context. Antonio Guterres, who, uh, you know, essentially, uh, with, with organisations like ours, f founded this commission at the last COP, um, has made this point. You know, we, we, we run the real risk that even if we have resolved our political differences about climate change and the need to respond to it, even if we, you know, are no longer having climate wars with people saying global warming is a hoax or whatever, uh, nonetheless, you've got to get the stuff built. You know, as a, you would have heard me say many times over the years, Moore's law does not apply to digging holes. There is no substitute for getting on with it. Uh, and, you know, that this commission has drafted some sensible ways of speeding up these processes while at the same time ensuring there is adequate uh, consultation and community buy-in. Finally, we need solid green hydrogen standards and certification. This may sound a little dry and esoteric, but standards and certification are absolutely crucial for the development of green hydrogen industry and global trade. Beware of people who talk about clean hydrogen. They're the same people who brought you clean coal. <laughs> okay, you need a standard. We need to be very clear what we're talking about. Um, Producers and consumers need an agreed mechanism for verifying that emissions are close to zero and that green hydrogen has been produced in a sustainable way. They are critical for the industry's social licence. Unfortunately, some standards being adopted around the world risk validating hydrogen produced with unacceptably high emissions. Now, the Australian Government has made some good progress on a national certification scheme, however, it doesn't include a clear threshold defining what is green or clean. And it doesn't address the social and environmental impact of the industry. For example, the sustainability of water resource or land management. If green hydrogen production is damaging the environment or not delivering, delivering economic benefits for host communities, it will stall. Now, only genuinely clean hydrogen can help solve the climate crisis, was the pithy title The Guardian put on my recent contribution, which I written, wrote about this topic. It sounds too obvious to worth mentioning, if only it was true that it doesn't need to be mentioned. I hope you accept that I quote myself here, but as I wrote in The Guardian, as our industry grows from almost nothing today, we'll struggle to compete with fossil fuel hydrogen unless strict emissions limits are set. We cannot afford to play footloose with this key part of the energy transition. We call for an end to any talk of undefined clean or undefined low carbon hydrogen. Standards, certification, taxation or support schemes which do not include a credible emissions limit for hydrogen production should come to an end. Now, the Green Hydrogen Organisation, which I chair, has established the Green Hydrogen Standard. It requires that green hydrogen made with renewable electricity emits no more than one kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen up to the point of production. That is a 90% reduction compared to grey hydrogen made from fossil fuels, and we've committed to lower this threshold further. The Green Hydrogen Standard is doing pioneering work on water management, life cycle emissions, including transport, the utilisation of biomass and developing standards for green hydrogen derivatives like e-methanol, synthetic methane or e-methane, e and sustainable aviation fuels. We'll launch an updated standard at the COP28 Climate Summit later this year in Dubai. So Australia needs to be at the forefront of adopting high global standards, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because we won't win a race to the bottom if we take the 
lowest common denominator approach to mutual recognition of national standards. We want to race to the top. We've got to be the best. Uh, and just it, clarity about the low emission standards, precision, is absolutely critical. So to conclude, Australia has an immense opportunity to be a green hydrogen leader. That's why we're all here. But time is running out. We need to get on with it right now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Turnbull. There was uh, a lot of very interesting points, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussions in the corridors, uh, particularly around the permitting. And I was very interested to hear the uh, strong position about what your thoughts around the CCS technology. Um, our next speaker, or our last speaker uh, for this morning, but before we move to the uh, morning tea break, is a great friend of the Global Wind Energy Council, Mr. Henrik Steesdale. Henrik's been a pioneer in the wind industry. Uh, he's been working in wind for four, over 40 years. He's uh, actually done, he holds so many patents in the uh, wind industry, in the wind sector. I've had the pleasure of working with Henrik uh, in the turbine manufacturing space. And now Henrik is uh, no, the COO of Steesdale Industries. Well done. Thanks, Henrik. And please welcome him. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. yeah, thank you, and thanks for the, for the honor of, of being invited here to speak on uh, such important topics. Um, green hydrogen in 20 years, a vision of the future. There you can say um, a prediction over 20 years. Hmm. Um, if we think about 20 years back, we had the Iraq war that actually transformed the world because it positioned the West against the Muslim world. Um, that's a long time ago. We had the 2003 heat wave in Europe with Sevilla recording a record 40 degrees of temperature, 50,000 dead in Western Europe due to the heat. Uh, by the way, this year we had another heat wave, and Sevilla went from 40 degrees to 48 degrees. In 2003, we inaugurated the world's largest offshore wind farm. Um, I actually had the good luck of being involved in this project, 165 megawatts with 2.3 megawatt machines. Now the largest offshore wind farm, Hornsea, I think is 2,600 megawatts. So what a step. Very hard to see back in 2003. If you look at solar, in 2003, we had reached the impressive five, $4.5 per watt. Wow, what a reduction from $80 per watt in 1976. But still, hard to predict that now, 20 years later, we are not at $4.50, we had 25 cents. What we did not have in 2003 was Facebook, that only came around in 2006, not kind of for the general public, but in a more widespread US community. What we also did not have was perhaps the biggest transition of the lives of all of us here, the smartphone. That came in January 2007 completely transformed our lives. What we also did not have was a financial crisis. We did not see that coming in 2003. And what we also did not have was the Fukushima disaster that really changed the way that we looked at energy in the world. So, a 20-year vision, that is a super ambitious uh, uh, thing to ask little me to give. Um, if you look at, at some of the hard facts, we are in the midst of global warming. It's not going well. It is man-made. And the main driver of global warming is our use of fossil fuels. So 73% of our emissions arise from our use of fossil fuels. That is the root cause of what we are in here. 
And where we are headed is, of course, a good question. Who knows? Who has really the vision? These are five of the scenarios that IPCC had put out. We could actually, as humanity, have chosen a trajectory that would give us the lowest of these. And these are maybe, at a first glance, a little difficult to understand. You just need to look at the left bar of the five scenarios. That's our total emissions composed of CO2 as a major contribution, and then some methane that also adds, and then a little bit of carbon uh, use or take up from the atmosphere. We could have chosen the left one that would give us one and a half degrees, or even the second left one that would give us on the order of two. We did choose this one here. That is where we are as humanity now, with some good luck, heading for 2.7 degrees of temperature rise, half a billion climate refugees by the end of the century. Half a billion of refugees, that's not good, because they simply can't stay where they are. There's an error bar, we could end up there at three and a half degrees. That's one billion climate refugees. That's definitely not good in every sense of the word. And the problem is that emissions are really increasing in Asia, where we have the big population growth. So we're actually slightly declining in the Western countries, the usual culprits of emissions, but we are seriously rising in Asia. Asia in 2021 emitted 110% of the rest of the world put together. So any solution needs to be able to tackle the Asian situation. There's no technical obstacle to getting rid of fossil fuels. This energy system here is really, really simple. Three inputs, wind, sun, and biomass, and outputs that cover every need of every modern society. It is not rocket science. The core approach is electrify everything that can be electrified. That is our first move. Wind and sun, with some stories, as was already mentioned to firm up, electricity, electrify everything we can. What we cannot electrify, use hydrogen as our vector into that. We could also add ammonia. That's very easy to do because it doesn't require any carbon. We can make ammonia out of hydrogen and nitrogen from the air. But to get the full Monty, we also need the carbon pathways, and they go either via anaerobic digestion or via pyrolysis. Pyrolysis has a big advantage that it delivers carbon sequestration as part of the process. And with that, we can make any remaining fuel or chemical needed by society. We cannot just decide not to use anything with carbon. If you look at, at transportation, um, we can electrify even heavy onshore transport, but we can't electrify ocean-going shipping. That would be a mix of ammonia and and, um, and uh, carbon fuels with a little bit of electricity, we cannot electrify aviation other than in short haul uh, 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 arrangements. Um, uh, aviation needs, cannot even use the alcohols like methanol. It needs classical fuels, not fossil fuels, but classical fuels that are composed of alkanes here, dodecane, that is the main constituent of kerosene and the aromatics and a lot of other things. We do need carbon as part of our energy future. It just cannot be fossil carbon. So we have our um, today's mix. And if we look at what is doable, this is what is doable. We can electrify our way out of the largest part of the fossil emissions, but a significant part, about 40%, cannot be electrified. That needs to rest on hydrogen as our main vector. This is, of course, a little bit a strange slide because this is the 2043 emissions, but the light blue energy sources are not emitting anything, so we get down to one quarter and are left with the agricultural and waste emissions. There are mainly methane. We can't solve that with hydrogen or with electricity. We need other solutions for that. Now, what does this actually mean in energy terms? So we need a significant percentage of something we are now doing with fossil fuel. What does that take of energy? It takes 250 exajoule. Okay, exa 
dual, that sort of, hmm, not maybe really sort of intuitively understandable. 250 exajoule, that's a lot of energy. That's 250 million, million megajoule. Okay, that didn't make us a lot cleverer. Hydrogen energy content, 100 megajoule, 120 megajoule per kilogram, let's say 125 to make it easy. That means we need 2,000 million tons of hydrogen. 2,000 million tons of hydrogen. That's a lot. That takes about 1,000 terawatts of uh, renewable energy in round figures. Can you actually do that? That's a good question. Some projections of hydrogen markets, and this is just one out of many, actually are not that far off. So these are clever analysts who think about the future. This particular uh, regionally split uh, uh, suggestion says 300 million tons in 2050, not too far from our 2,000 million tons. Okay, in a way, you can say it's far, but in the light of the uncertainties of projections, as we saw from the uncertainty of our projections, have we done them in 2003, it's not so far off. What it would, would require of growth is 40% growth on renewables per year. 40% means doubling every two years. Is that doable? I can tell you from personal experience it is eminently doable, at least for significant periods of time. The wind industry, or at least the company I worked in, doubled every year from 1989 until 2001. Then we kind of ran out of breath in good old bonus energy took a few years of rest, were taken over by Siemens, and then for the next 10 years, we doubled every two years. It is eminently doable if we want it to happen. So this is actually my vision. This is, you can say, come on, keep on dreaming, but a vision is a vision. This is my vision, that we replace all of the fossil fuels with a largest proportion of direct electrification and a smaller proportion but very significant still, of hydrogen-based fuels. That is the vision. And the means to getting there is mass production, industrialization, volume. And you actually cannot intuitively understand how strong that is. And this is the same solar curve as I showed earlier, and you can see this fantastic reduction. And then there's these curves going out to the right, they are projections made, the red ones, by IEA, the International Energy Agency, what they believe will happen. And what they have believed in different years, they always got it wrong. They were always too conservative. The blue curves are what people who made input for IPCC believed. They also always got it wrong. These are the sharpest kids on the block on projections. They still always got it wrong. They always underpredicted the impact of mass production. That is our lever. So finally, this is kind of like a little bit of chitty chat, but still, when we, when we look at our challenge here and the crisis of, of the climate, we can look to the Chinese. Uh, in, in Chinese, a crisis is, pardon my Chinese, please, by Ji, I think it is. And that's composed of two signs, and the two signs spell danger and opportunity. And for us who are there, who are here, the climate crisis is a danger to some moderate extent to us, to a larger extent to our kids, to an even larger extent to our grandchildren. But it also brings huge opportunity. And I hope that we, as individuals, as companies, as organizations, as humanity, will rise to that and grab that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrik, and uh, I apologise. I think in my opening I said you're COO of your own company, but it's CTO, so thank you. Thank you once again. This concludes the uh, morning session. We are going to adjourn now until quarter past 11. On the program it says 11 o'clock, but we'll actually keep the uh, networking session till 11.15. So if you're interested in the next session, which is going to be the, the TEDx or the Rex talks with our 
uh, various panel members, please be in here at 11.15. Uh, there is coffee, tea and refreshments served in the exhibition area, which is when you come out of the theatre, if you turn to the right and just walk, you walk directly into the exhibition area. Thank you everyone for this morning and we look forward to seeing you at 11.15. Thanks.